بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Welcome my dear brothers and sisters to our lessons here at Masjid Al-Azhar Bilmo every Friday night after Maghrib We ask Allah to allow us to benefit from these gatherings Tonight your best investment your greatest investment, your children, our children. Inshallah, we'd like to discuss raising children in Islam. Now, when we discuss this topic, our ulama, they started to discuss this from many angles. So much so, they started to discuss this topic from raising children in Islam. It starts before you even get married. And before we, we speak about this, we speak about marriage and selecting a proper spouse, proper husband, proper wife, and some of the sunan, we'd like to remind ourselves that life is a test. We have a purpose in life, and life is a test. As we know, our purpose in life is to worship Allah alone, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah tells us, and, and I did not create jinn in mankind except for the sole reason, for the sole purpose, of worshipping me alone, worshipping Allah alone subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that life is a test, as Allah tells us in Surah Al-Mulk, that He created death and life to see which one of us is best in deeds. So we're going to be trialed, we're going to face tests and trials. And from the greatest tests are children. From the greatest blessings children having children and on the day of judgment we're going to be asked about our children how did we bring them up did we bring them up on Islam or other than Islam was Islam in our house or Islam was forgotten in our households and Allah tells us protect yourselves and your family from the fire. Protect yourself and your family, your children from the fire. So our children are a trial and will be asked about them on the day of judgment. So once we understand life is a test, once we know we're going to face tests and trials, once we know children are a great blessing, Many people do not have children. They don't have this great blessing. So we'll be asked about this blessing. Do we, do we use this blessing in the path of Allah for the sake of Allah? Or do we use this blessing in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? After knowing this, we also have to know that Allah is the one who guides. True guidance is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Upon us is to show the way. As we know, we hear always in the, in the, in the Qur'an and the Sunnah and in the, the opening sermon for Jum'ah, whoever Allah guides is the rightly guided. And whoever Allah leads astray, no one will form unto God him aright. True guidance, when you're making someone Muslim, keeping someone firm, is from Allah alone. So what is upon us? To show the way. To give da'wah. To teach our children. Educate our children. But in the end of the day, everything is in the hands of Allah. Everything is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see this with the prophets. The prophets, who called to Allah better than them? No one. The prophets and messengers, no one. Yet we see that Allah did not guide some of the family members. Who can give me an example? Whose family members weren't guided, but they done the best they could. Who can give me an example? Nuh alayhi salam. Lut alayhi salam, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi himself, Abu Talib, his beloved uncle, the one who helped him and looked after him, he died on shirk. Prophet sallallahu alayhi was calling him, Prophet sallallahu alayhi was calling him to Islam in his last moments, say la ilaha illallah, give me something with which I can plead for you on the day of judgment. And he had the leaders of kufr on the other side, on his deathbed, 
telling him, are you going to leave the religion of your forefathers? And he died, his last words being, ala millati al-abdil muttalib. On the way, on the path of Abdul Muttalib, his father, which was idol worship and shirk. So this was devastating for the Prophet ﷺ. But it's a lesson for us and for everybody that guidance, true guidance is in the hands of Allah. And Allah told the Prophet ﷺ and revealed ayat regarding this incident, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْدَبْتْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ You are Prophet Muhammad ﷺ and everyone after him. Do not guide whom you want, but Allah guides whom he wants. Guidance is in his hands. We have to understand that. And do our best. Do our best. But at the end of the day, Allah is the one who guides. Which should lead us to make what? Dua. Dua. The prophets and messengers knew that guidance was in the hands of Allah. When they would talk and make dua and praise Allah, they would say, you have given me. You have blessed me. As Isa would say when he was born, you have made me blessed. They returned all the favors back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the blessings back to Allah. So we have to acknowledge that God is in the hands of Allah. And we have to make dua for our children. Make dua. Before you get married, make dua. When you're married, you make dua. After you have kids, you make dua. And until you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua is a direct link between you and Allah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we know, there's many things we can do. Etiquettes of dua, which we don't have time for tonight. But obviously for the dua to be answered, there's etiquettes. Make sure you're doing good, keeping away from bad. Make sure your income is halal. And so on and so forth. And lastly, regarding this introduction, if you want your kids to be righteous, if you want our kids to be righteous and have taqwa, we need to have taqwa ourselves. The ulama, they said, from the fruits of you having taqwa, of being a muttaqi, someone who is conscious of Allah, is righteous children. I'll repeat it. When someone has taqwa, what is, what is something that Allah will give him? Righteous children. Allah will protect his children for him, even after his death. We just finished the day of Friday. What surah do we always read on Friday? Surah Al-Kahf. In the story of Musa and Khidr, alayhim as what do we hear? Khidr rebuilt a wall. A wall was crumbling, he rebuilt it. Why did he rebuild it? Who knows? There was a treasure under it. And it was for two orphans. And the parents of these orphans, what was he? They were righteous. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the inheritance of these orphans because their father was righteous. You want Allah to protect your children, to guide your children? Have taqwa. Do the halal, keep away from the haram. Place a barrier between yourself and the haram. And do all that which Allah has subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered you to do. Be conscious of Allah. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be aware of Allah at all times. As Prophet ﷺ said, Fear Allah wherever you are. And follow up, a bad deed with a good, follow up a bad deed with a good deed and wipe it away. And treat the people with the best of manners. Have the best of character. Moving on. We don't want to take too much of your time. Our ulama, they said there is no way out of our current crisis that we see our children in, that we see the Muslims in in general, except by returning to the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We must implement Islam in our daily lives, in our homes, at work, with other humans, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslims. We have to live Islam, breathe Islam. Have that link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to get out of the crisis that many of us are facing, the calamities that many of us are facing. And from the greatest calamities is having children who are away from Islam. Far away from Islam. So the question presents itself. How do we raise a good child? When does it start? What do I have to do? 
And this needs many, many lessons, but inshallah we'll introduce the topic tonight. But firstly we have to understand, as our ulama have said, that having a good child, a God-fearing child, is the most precious treasure a Muslim may have and may leave behind. So that's really your greatest investment. Your greatest investment is not how many zeros you have in your bank account, or what you own, or what you possess. It's your children. Because when you die, all your deeds come to an end, don't they? Except for three things. What are they? So you die, everything's done, gone, finished. What are they? Who knows them? Three things the Prophet ﷺ said. A righteous child who makes what? Dua for you. Sadaqatun jariyah. An ongoing charity and beneficial knowledge. Ongoing beneficial knowledge that is benefited from. Now a question to you. Can a pious child help you in all these three? Can he? He can make dua for you, definitely. What about sadaqah? Yes. Ongoing sadaqah. What about beneficial knowledge? Who do you think if you have beneficial knowledge, who, who will share it the most for you? Who will share it with others? Your child as well, your grandchildren as well. So this is what's most important. This is your investment. That's why we have to put in time now with our children. So when we are gone, our reward keeps going and going and going. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ, he told us in a hadith that a man will be raised in status in the next life in Jannah. And he won't know why. And he'll be told, because a pious, your child is making istighfar for you. He's seeking forgiveness for you. Therefore, you'll be raised levels in Jannah. What else do you want more than that? Also, we know that if the parents are righteous, Allah from His favor will allow the children to elevate to them and no one will lose any reward. As Allah mentions in the Quran translation of the meaning, and those who believe and whose families, whose descendants follow them in true faith, in Iman, to, to them shall we join their families, nor, nor shall we deprive them of the fruit of anything of their deeds. Should not deprive them of any of the works they've done. So in the tafsir, Ibn Kathir, he mentions that say for example, parents reach a higher level in Jannah. From the favor of Allah upon, upon the parents, he will raise these children to be with their parents. How great is that? How great is that? But obviously here they have to have Iman. They have to have Iman. So we have to take and do all we can do to have righteous children, to be righteous ourselves, so we can be with them in the next life, in eternal paradise. And also when we leave, if we do die before them, which is not guaranteed, Allah knows who's going to die first, our rewards keep on going and going. That's your greatest investment. That's the wise person. But the one who doesn't give us stuff, doesn't care, couldn't care less about his child. His child is out, he doesn't know where he is. His child's on the TV, watching anything, on the tablet, going wherever. That's not, he's not investing, he's not looking after his investment. So where should we start? For the brothers who are single, start with dua. Oh Allah, give me a pious wife. Sister, he's single, oh Allah, give me a pious husband. Give me pious children. From now. And then when selecting a spouse, we're not going to get into the details of this, this is in the fuck of marriage. But when you select a spouse quickly, Make sure you select someone who you would like to be the mother or father of your children. Who you want their family members to be your family. You want the brothers of your potential wife or the brothers of your potential husband and sisters to be the aunts and uncles of your children. That's what you should look for. So what should we look for in a wife or husband quickly? What should we look for quickly? Beauty? I'm going to marry the most beautiful person in Australia. Money? 
The brother who has the most money in his bank account, he's for me. Everything else doesn't matter. Family, she's from the best family, the most respected family. Reputation, they're well known. Status, everyone respects them. What do you think? Prophet said the lady is married for four things. What are they? What are they? Family status, lineage, beauty and wealth. And what's the last one? Deen. Go for the one with the deen. You'll be the winner. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us another narration regarding, if, regarding what to look for in a male. Two things. Deen and character. Deen and character. Because you have today, Allahumma sta'ayin, brothers and sisters, they have deen. Every second word is a swear word. They're bad-mannered, ill-tempered. This is not what we want. We want deen and character. They go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. So especially when selecting a potential mother for your children, the mother is basically the school of the nation. She's the first teacher for your children. The mother is very important. Very, very important. That's why be wise and likewise the husband. Be very, very, very wise. And this goes back to the parents as well. When selecting and helping their children select potential partners, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and look at what's best for them, not only in this world, but in the next. There's nothing wrong with marrying someone you're attracted to physically. They have beauty and they have wealth. No problem. As long as they have deen. As long as they have religion. Okay. Also, when someone gets married, we know, start off your marriage obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't start off by doing haram, by having haram weddings, music and dancing and all this haram stuff that people do today. Start off seeking Allah's pleasure, seeking His help. And as we know in the sunnah, there's many things you can do um, when the marriage is consummated, certain dua you can make. Even some of the salaf would pray two raqqa with, with their wives before on the wedding night. And there's a dua that you do before intimacy as well. And also when having children, there's many sunan. We'll go over them very quickly. Um, that Say someone is giving birth. She gives birth. What, what are some of the stuff she can do? The ulama discussed this in these books because it's got to do with raising children. Now the first issue, and it's, it's a bit of controversy regarding the topic, is the adan. Should you do the adan when your child is born? Any muhaddithin here? Any scholars of hadith here? Who want to give us the tarjih on the hadith? Okay, firstly, regarding the iqama, doing the iqama in the left ear, that hadith is weak. Which leaves us, leaves us with the hadith of the adan. Doing the adan when the child is born. The ulama are different. Many said it's weak, therefore not, not recommended. And others said it's, all, it's acceptable and you can do it. Either way, many said you can do it because it's the first, you want the first thing that the child hears is, is to hear la ilaha illallah, to hear, to hear the shahada, to hear Allah's greatness being proclaimed and so on uh, and so forth. Wallahu a'lam. Another thing that is recommended as well is tahniq, which is the process of chewing a day or something similar and then putting some of the pulp on the new, new, new child or the newborn's uh, gums. And as Abu Musa reported that a son was born to me and I took him to the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Musa is a great companion. So he said a son was born to me and I took him to the Prophet ﷺ, who named him Ibrahim, did tahniq for him with a day, invoked Allah to bless him and returned him to me. So that's what the ulama said as well. Choosing a good name for the child is also recommended. What are the best names? And when should you name the child? When should you name the child? First night, seventh. Both I mentioned. The first day and the seventh. Prophet ﷺ, he said, A boy was born to me this night and I have named him with the name of my father Ibrahim. As is mentioned in Sahih Muslim. So he named him on the first night. Also another narration, Aisha said, radiallahu anha, that the Messenger of Allah did aqiqah for Hassan and, and Hussein on the seventh day and gave them their names as well. So here, on the seventh day. 
So a Muslim parent should choose the best name for their children. Following the advice of the Prophet wasallam, who said that the dearest names to Allah are Abdullah and Abdul Rahman. These are the dearest names to Allah. So we learn from this hadith that the best names to Allah are Abdullah and Abdul Rahman. And the ulama also said that after this category, this is the best category to name Abdullah and Abdul Rahman. The second best category is all the names which express enslavement and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abd, Abdul Aziz in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abdul Rahim, Abdul Malik, Abdul Salam, and so on and so forth. The third category of best names is to name the pro- after the prophets and messengers. Especially the greatest messengers, the, 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 the messengers who are firm determination, the mightiest messengers as it's been translated as, and they are the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Prophet Ibrahim, Isa, Musa, and Nuh alayhim as After that, the names of the righteous, starting with the companions, and those after them, the tabi'een, and so on and so forth, all the righteous ulama. And lastly, any good name which has a proper and pleasant meaning, a good meaning. Wallahu a'lam. Next thing, and we'll finish with this, is aqiqah, performing the aqiqah for the child. And as the Prophet Sallallahu said, aqiqah is to be offered for a newly born baby. Um, so slaughter an animal for him and relieve him of his suffering. Now, Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, he said that the majority of the scholars agree that the Prophet Sallallahu was asked about the aqiqah and he ordered that two sheep be slaughtered for a boy and one sheep for a girl, which is the sunnah. So there are many benefits for the aqiqah. You're following the sunnah and, it's to be done for, and it is to be done on the seventh day. So how do we count the seventh day? Do we count the first day or we count the next day as the first day? What do you think? No takers? You count the first day. So say the child's born on a Friday, you count Friday as one. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So you have the Akiko on the next Thursday. That's how you count it. And Ibn al-Qayyim, he said, there are many benefits to the aqiqah. Among the benefits are, it is a sacrifice by means which the child is brought close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala soon after he comes into this world. He also said it is a ransom for the newborn. His aqiqah ransoms him so that he can intercede for his parents. Three, it is a sacrifice by which the newborn is ransomed, just as Allah ransomed Ismail with the ram. And others mentioned perhaps another benefit of the aqiqah is the gathering of the relatives and friends for the walima, for the feast. So what's the ruling regarding it? Is it a fard or is it a highly recommended sunnah? The scholars differed. Some said it was obligatory and others said that it's a confirmed sunnah, a highly recommended sunnah. Now other things to do for the newborn is circumcision, shaving the child's head and uh, on the seventh day and giving out in charity Gold or silver equal in weight to the hair. So if we want pious children, we should follow the sunnah when they are born. And that's one of the best things to do. To follow the sunnah. It is the best thing to do. Follow the Quran and sunnah. And this is an introduction to this topic. Inshallah next time we will start to speak about how to give our children a complete Islamic education. How to provide a proper environment for our children. We will discuss the home environment. We will discuss the peer environment, their friends, and we will discuss the community environment. Bismillah ta'ala. Wallahu a'lam. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyana Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Barakallahu fikum. Wa salamu alaykum. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Al-Bayan Radio. The voice of Ahl-Sunnati wal-Jama'ah.